Let's start it. Yeah. So what you have before you, and sorry, uh, folks at home, uh, will will clue you into what we have before us. Uh, we have a sheet that has all of the scripture readings. There are five of, uh, well, six of them, uh, five of them that were recommended for this morning. And uh, this morning we start out with Jeremiah 17, verse seven and eight. It's on the sheet. Well, yeah, I know. I'm and uh, what I'm uh, hoping that we will do is uh, listen to these words closely and be prepared to respond to, uh, yeah, this is not a question, it's an assignment. If there is a word or phrase <laughs> that just jumps out at you that uh, causes you to perk up, and pay closer attention. Uh, we're going to ask you to respond to that after we're finished reading. We'll be doing that with all five of these. So, Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. Hmm. Anything that leaps out at you? A word or a phrase? Not anxious. Yeah, correct. Not anxious, yes. Not anxious. And why is it not anxious? Because it knows that water is right there. Just mm -hmm. the way we know that if we're present and open, God is right there. Mm -hmm. And the other one that jumped out to me is trust. It seems like trust came up recently at our class that was just before the elders meeting. And I think that um, that trust and trust building is, is so essential. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Ladies, you two, anything to say? Nothing left out at you, huh? Okay. Um, <clears throat> this Bible study today is a different style than what you usually get from Steve and me. <laughs> um, and it, it's more about our, our response to the mm -hmm. images that uh, Rebecca has suggested for our study. <clears throat> uh, the next one is Isaiah 55, 8 through 13. And I say that again, Isaiah 55, 8 through 13. So that you can look it up if you want, but you may prefer simply to listen, eyes closed if you want even, and let the images form in your head. I call it the mental movie. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign, that shall not be cut off. 
Any image jump out at you from that section? Um, for me, it was the, uh, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. But what really stood out was it shall accomplish that which I purpose. God's purpose will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a child, the thought of trees clapping their hands struck me as odd. <laughs> and then I became oh, more subtle in my thinking and realized that the trees do actually clap their hands on a windy day. You can hear the branches banging together. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have a whole forest, the wind usually only affects the top of the trees, but it has an effect to do that all through the whole forest so that there's quite a noise. And it does sound a little bit like people, a large crowd clapping their hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, eh, every time that I read this phrase, I think, yeah, trees clapping their hands. I know that to be true now but it only happens when the wind blows, mm -hmm. which all through scripture is an indication of the movement of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think at this point, it would probably be a good idea if, uh, if we take a long look at Jeremiah and Isaiah okay. in their context. I like the mountains and the hills bursting into song. That, that is so contrary to anything that has any kind of natural explanation. It just seems like a really dramatic response to the presence of God. And yet I've heard it. Um, not in, in recent years, but... Uh, I've climbed to the top of several 14,000 foot mountains in Colorado, and I can tell you that when a rock comes loose and tumbles down the hill, um, it does sing. Hmm. As, as it bounces against other rocks, there's a, a sing-songy kind of a sound going on, and it, depending on the, uh, the steepness of the slope, it can go on for a long time. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if that's what Isaiah experienced in the mountains, but hmm. I sure have. Hmm. Uh, we are, uh, yes. Uh, here's Cheryl. Maybe not. Well, it takes a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Welcome, Cheryl. Oh, she can't. Yeah, she can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good morning. So the important thing about these two passages is uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah are uh, speaking to the uh, situation of a whole nation collapsing uh, due to the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar and his army from Babylon. Mm -hmm. And so everything is coming apart at the seams. The prospect of losing themselves as a nation is all caught up in what Jeremiah is uh, helping the uh, people to understand. This passage in Isaiah is uh, written beginning at the end of that 50, 60 year period of time when they were in exile in Babylon. And now the prospect of going back home is uh, is what is being spoken to. In either case, it's trusting in God and knowing that we, like trees, are to bear fruit, even in the worst of times. Mm -hmm. Or 
we are to be immovable on getting our nourishment from the waters of God, mm -hmm. the movement of God in our midst. Even in the worst of times, we do not express worry, we express joy at knowing that no matter what, the presence of God is with us. Does that kind of cover it? Mm -hmm. Maybe? Yes, I think that's sufficient. So now we get into Matthew. And again, we have talk of trees. It is our 75th anniversary theme. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, this is Jesus speaking. It's one of his parables. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Mm -hmm. What word or phrase leaped out at you? If you're making notes at home, that was Matthew 13, 31 and 32. There's nothing there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll read it again. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The smallest, greatest comparison really stood out that time. Honestly, it feels like there's some kind of translation error here because mustard seeds aren't that small and mustard plants aren't that big. Exactly so. Uh, there is no translation ever. The, uh, the issue is that Jesus is speaking in uh, extremes, mm -hmm. which he often did. Mm -hmm. Mustard doesn't actually ever become a tree. Mm -hmm. So why did Jesus say that? I think he was trying to get across a point mm -hmm. that's very similar to the one that Jeremiah and, and Isaiah were saying. It is not we who are in charge. It is not even nature that is in charge. God is in charge. And the kingdom of heaven goes from extremes, starting out very small and becoming unexpectedly large, mm. not by any effort of our own. The next one is Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the man working the vineyard, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And he replied, sir, let it alone for one more year 
until I dig it around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, the Greek text actually ends right there. Most English translations finish the sentence to say, but if not, you can cut it down. Mm -hmm. I think what we have here is the gardener doing, if not, mm -hmm. and Luke just didn't know how to spell a shrug of the shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> what stands out if anything <clears throat> our grandson would say manure <laughs> only, only actually he spells it p-o-o-p yeah. <laughs> he's fixated on poop <laughs> he's in kindergarten and it's one of the first words he learned how to spell <laughs> totally normal nothing more interesting and funny than anything having to do with poop for the age group. Uh -huh. yep. yeah. exactly learning how bodies work uh -huh. When we moved here three years ago, notice this says three years, okay, we planted a lime tree and two avocado trees in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Now, both of those trees were already a year or two old. Mm -hmm. uh, they were fairly large pots. Okay. Uh, the lime started bearing last year. The avocados started bearing last year, which is, I would guess, their third or fourth year of age. Mm. I don't know a thing about fig trees, but I expect that a tree has to get to a certain level of maturity mm. before it bears fruit. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that owner doesn't know that. Mm. Or he's anxious. And is wanting it cut down because it isn't bearing soon enough when it just isn't yet time. Yeah. Yeah. And I suspect that the gardener does know that. And is very diplomatic. <laughs> mm -hmm. And expects to see fruit in the fourth year. And so says to the owner, ah, let's just give it one more. I think, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Rather than confronting the owner's ignorance, which would have got him nowhere anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Let the owner figure it out. <laughs> I can't help but wonder that maybe Luke is also referring to the one year that Jesus was in ministry. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, let's let's wait a year mm. and see what happens. A uh, fig tree was uh, oftentimes considered the uh, national uh, tree. It, it was held as a symbol of Israel and uh, often appeared in a lot of the artwork, uh, bas relief carvings into stone and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, I think, probably the reason why in another place, uh, Jesus curses a fig tree mm -hmm. because it bore no fruit. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's an interesting uh, choice, fig tree. And again, what we uh, have going on here is fruitfulness there are a number of places in the old testament where an idyllic human life is presented as each one having his own vine and fig tree to sit under mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and here we have the fig tree in the vineyard mm -hmm. 
I don't know if that means anything or not, but just occurred to me that connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we have Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life and its 12 kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Anything leap out at you? Um, 12 kinds of fruit, you know, a, a fruit for each month. Um, yeah. And a single tree. And a single tree. <laughs> and you've probably seen in seed catalogs and plant catalogs that they they advertise trees that have been grafted to have all these different fruits. I never tried to grow one, but but it well, seems what's that? A fruit for each tribe. Each tribe of Israel. Oh, one for each tribe, yeah. Yeah. Twelve yeah. tribes, the twelve disciples. Yeah. Yeah. Twelve is you know, yeah. like a really significant number. Uh -huh. The healing of the nations kind of just pops out to me in a kind of lectio kind of way, too. Yeah. Anything else you'd say about that healing of the nations? Um, it, it strikes me that uh, it's important that it says nations here, that it's plural. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the ways that uh, the New Testament especially refers to everyone, both Jew and Gentile. Uh -huh. It's not just for the Jewish nation, but for everyone. And the 12 kinds of fruit, one each month, is a, a tree bearing year-round, yeah. rather remarkable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, 12, thank you for noticing the 12, um, uh, biblically 12 is a number that represents, uh, completeness in a sense of faith. Uh, all of the 12s are the, the fullness of faith. It's the whole nation of Israel. It's the wholeness of those following Jesus, um, it's 12 kinds of fruit. The, uh, the vision given in, in the whole of Revelation 22 is for a restoration of creation the way God intends it to be, the fullness of what God has created. So it sounds like there's a tree on either side of this river, and, and we have a little notation here. Thank you here. for catching that. <laughs> B, yeah. I'm wondering the significance of that. Um, on each side. I didn't look that up. Huh. Yeah, it's in in the loss can, really, of uh, of a, a, an Eden existence. Yeah. Uh, due to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, we lost uh, our proper place in the creation and uh, lost some of our humanity. Uh, our ability to be in close connection with both nature and nature's God. Mm -hmm. And so when that fracture uh -huh. takes place, uh, according, to, uh, P, uh, according to Paul, the old Adam created strife and death, and the loss of Eden is implied. Uh, but he promises that with Jesus Christ, we have a second Adam, a new Adam. Mm -hmm. And the implication of that is a new Eden, mm -hmm. which I think that it would be fair to say that Jesus was referring to a renewal of our relationship uh, when he talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, as some of the gospels uh, have Jesus saying, 
uh, it's the old order that God intended with Eden is now possible to us. And that's what John is writing about in Revelation. It's interesting that there's one tree and there and it's on both sides of the stream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Try and draw that picture in your mind. Yeah. Well, I have gone to the same website that I copied from and it does not include the footnotes yeah. in the uh, um, huh. is the in, in the life. phone version. So I'm almost seeing a tree that grows up with the water running down through part of it. It has two mm -hmm. trunks and then it's connected at the top mm -hmm. as the tree of life. Yes. You've got a good artistic mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I visualize it. What do you think it comes to me is that if the tree's on both sides of the river, wherever you are, you have access to it. Where, you wherever you are, what? You have access. On both sides. Yeah. Either side and still have access to it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Everybody everywhere. Yes, yes. It's All quite inclusive. a picture, isn't it? It is quite a picture. Yes. And notice the water for the tree is flowing from the throne of God. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, in uh, in weeks past, we the have had water. a... You know, what? The living water. The living water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Living water for the tree of life. Yeah. In uh, in weeks past, during this month, uh, we've had a sheet with a whole slew of questions about the church. Right. Uh, I would put it to you now, are all these passages referring to a people of faith? And uh, is tree to be uh, considered uh, possibly the church who we are a part of? Mm -hmm. Where was that? Part? A very talkative group today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, that's what was coming to me when we were talking about the mustard seed that grows into a great tree. Then the birds of the air come and make nests, you know, in a way. Um, to, that was speaking to me of church. You know, it's it's a place where people can come and make nests and and be sheltered and be sheltered and live more, hopefully more fully. Yeah, mm -hmm. with less fear of the predator. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Does it give anybody a sense of what the church's mission might be? Or is it just a general statement that we get from each of these passages? I look at the Jeremiah text. Uh, Jeremiah 17, seven through eight, Cheryl, since you weren't here at that point. Um, and I see there a, a tree that depends on God mm -hmm. for its uh, growth and continued life. Well, I think that's part of the point of most, if not all of these passages is that um, the growth of these trees does not depend on anything from us. It depends on um, the living water metaphorically anyway um that comes from god and it comes from god's plans not ours as you know the mm -hmm. the parable of the ignorant farmer tells us um <laughs> yeah. good name for that parable <laughs> but um yeah i think you know it, it get many messages you know of 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 trust of persistence of of understanding our place of faith and hope and also you know that our mission is for example the hearing of 
the healing of the nations and to um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. consider god as the source of all things for the restoration of of mm -hmm. the kingdom according to god's will indeed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it reminds me of this statement that is on the banner out there about sharing. I I can't quote it. I bet one of you can quote it, but I can't. Oh, about, something about sharing Christ's welcome. Yes, sharing quite Christ's welcome. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And that leads into what you were going to share at the very end of this. Mm-hmm. You, were we ready to go there? I think we are. Okay. Uh, Rebecca had selected the the tree images you've heard so far. Uh -huh. okay? uh, and I'll, I'll review those, uh, especially for those at home who don't have the, the copy that we printed and passed out. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Uh, Isaiah 55, 8 through 13. Then Matthew 13, 31 and 32, that's the parable of the fig tree. Uh, the parable of the ignorant farmer is Luke 13, 6 through 9. That's a really good name for that. Uh, Revelation 22, 1 and 2 is the tree of life in the middle of the street of the city. But there's one more tree that... Um, Rebecca's instruction said, and any other trees that we wanted to talk about. So uh, we do have one more. And if you're here and looking at a printed page, I've got an excerpt from it included there. It's Jesus family tree, which is Matthew 1, 1 through 17. And I thought it was worthy of inclusion in talking about trees and what they might have to say about church. Okay. Um, because Matthew's genealogy varies from the standard genealogy that was done at that time. Genealogies, and I'm a genealogist. I've been working on family tree for 55 years. Okay. I started when I was about 12. I caught the bug from my aunt. <laughs> and it has grown a long time. Um, but family trees are have a standard form. Okay. And in Matthew's day, they began at the top or the bottom, didn't matter. It could be Joseph, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. Or it could be, uh, let's see, Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, and so forth. All the begetting that you might be familiar with from the King James Version. Mm -hmm. okay. They went either direction. They only included the men. The fathering was the only thing important. The woman was considered to be a vessel, but not to contribute, uh, genealogically speaking, genetically speaking. Those two words are related, by the way. <laughs> okay. um, and so we have Matthew's genealogy, uh, where I have highlighted, I boldfaced, uh, <clears throat> Some of the names that you will undoubtedly recognize. Mm -hmm. And then I have bold and italicized some names that we should notice that you might or might not recognize. Yeah. Uh, Matthew begins an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Notice all the maleness in that passage. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. How often do we read in the New Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That's, it's almost one word. It's such a common phrase. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. That's the mother. 
and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Aminadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz, by Rahab, mother again. Boaz the father of Obed, by Ruth. Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Interesting way to phrase that, especially. Mm -hmm. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and on and on it goes down to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, a woman again, who bore Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now, why would Matthew include all those women? Any thoughts? Matthew has a point to make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's getting us ready for Mary. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Matthew writes this birth story from the point of view of Joseph. Mm -hmm. It's very much Joseph's story. When you read the Gospel of Luke, the story is more from Mary's point of view, but Matthew's story of Jesus begins with Joseph's version of the birth story. Joseph is engaged to Mary. Um, actually, it's more than an engagement. A betrothal is... Uh, it's as close to marriage as you can be without living together. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not easily broken off. Uh, ending a betrothal is akin to a divorce, not just a fare thee well. And Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant. Oh my goodness. That's considered adultery. Mm -hmm. Not simply she cut somebody else's eye. It's considered adultery, which is a violation of the marriage contract. Mm -hmm. Now, he doesn't know anything of what has happened to her, except that she's found to be pregnant, which means she's already showing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so as Matthew tells this story, he's getting us ready for what appears to be adultery, and an illicit child. Okay. Tamar? She was married to one of Judah's mm -hmm. sons. Mm -hmm. That son died. Was she married a second time? Mm -hmm. Two sons? Okay, yeah, I was thinking so. Uh, consulting my Bible dictionary right here at my right hand. <laughs> I haven't looked this closely at that detail. Um, so she'd been married twice to two of Judah's sons when the first died and they had no children yet. Uh, Israelite law, the law of leveret marriage, is that Judah had to give her the next available son huh. in order that Judah's genealogical line gets carried forward. Mm -hmm. And that's how Tamar has social security, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? is that she has a son to care for her in her old age mm -hmm. if she lives that long. Uh, life was hard. Yeah. But Judah, having lost two sons already, be, uh, who were married to Tamar, is reluctant to provide a third one for her, even though it is required of him by the law of the day. And so she has, she's bereft. She has no resources. She dresses herself as a lady of the evening and goes out to the area, the road where such women find their business, their clientele. She seduces Judah. And she does it several times until she is carrying his child. 
and she solicits from him a token of affection. When the child is born, then she goes back to Judah carrying that token that he recognizes as his own. Shaw must have left in order to come back to church. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Um, she goes back to him with the child. He says, oh, no, it can't be mine. You have lots of men. No, you are the one. You are the father. Here's the token. Huh. Oops. Well, that's where Perez comes from. Uh, at that point, Judah realizes his own sin in casting her out that way and marries her himself, takes her to him as a wife, and they have a second child. Uh, Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab was the, again, lady of the evening, Canaanite, not Israelite who sheltered the Israelite spies when they were sent to scope out the promised land. Can we move in here or not? She's the one who sheltered the spies and is adopted into Israel and married um, Salmon, becomes the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. You know Ruth's story. Mm -hmm. She is a Moabite woman, again, a foreigner. Um, I need to move this along. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. You know the name Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. And you may or may not know the story behind it. Bathsheba was married to Uriah. Mm -hmm. Uriah is a, a leader of some of the army. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He is away with the army when Bathsheba catches David's eye not intending to catch his eye, it just happened. She is bathing in her home, um, but it's visible. It's David who should not have been looking. And David manipulates the situation. He brings home the troops, gives Uriah some time off, you know, go home, spend some time with your wife. Well, Uriah says, no, I'm not going to do that when my men are still at war and camps with his soldiers and refuses to go home to his wife. So Bathsheba has no cover for her pregnancy. Uh, David finally arranges for Uriah to be murdered mm -hmm. so that he can marry Bathsheba. And she is the father of Solomon. It's a very checkered history that Matthew reminds us of. Mm -hmm. So that when Mary comes along and again has what appears to be a checkered history, we're ready to say, okay, it's happened. Let's see where this goes next. Mm -hmm. um, I shared this story about Jesus' family tree okay? uh, because the question Rebecca has asked is, what do these tree images say about being church. One of the things that churches tend to do over time is to become insular and to become um, guardians of righteousness mm -hmm. and to forget that people have a messy history. And we tend to have a hard time accepting people who come to us who have a messy history. We tend to have a hard time going out to people with a messy history to draw them in. And I think Matthew is telling us, hey, everybody, open your eyes. God works through all kinds of people, sinful, righteous, and otherwise. And God can use the works of any of those to accomplish God's purpose. And so I wanted to bring that tree 
in particular to talk about uh, as, as a segue into our study in March, which is going to be how the church welcomes outsiders, how the church deals with those outside the church. And it seemed like this tree might help us bridge both sides of that river <laughs> uh, from, from this month's study about trees into next month's study about who's an outsider and who's an insider and how we cross that bridge. Any responses that you bring to that? I hope you don't mind that I omitted a whole lot of people in verses 8 through 15 that most of us have never heard of. No. <laughs> Some of them don't even appear otherwise in scripture except in Matthew's list. Well, it sounds like this fits right in with sharing Christ's welcome. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And how, how, how do we how do we live that out? How do we um, intentionally live that out? Yes. How do we help outsiders become insiders? Yeah, yeah. I've heard about Welcome Saturday almost since the first time we came here. I know. And I wonder how we can help those folks who come to welcome Saturday also find a welcome on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It may be an impossible task, but I, I think it's worth thinking about. And I think it's happened on and off since we've been doing welcome Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people come, we've had people um, participate in our worship service and talk about their experience with Welcome Saturday. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was a, uh, we hadn't talked about this, but it, when you were delving into uh, Jesus's uh, genealogy, it occurred to me that uh, my great grandfather was a Methodist minister uh, in the 1910s at uh, a place oh, called yes. Delphos, Kansas. Um, <laughs> there were three women in, in Delphos who uh, nobody in any of the churches would have a thing to do with. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, her husband, had worked at the grain elevator and, and died uh, while on the job. Uh, elevator work can be really uh, mm -hmm. dangerous mm -hmm. and uh, she had no visible means of support and was uh, she had three children as I remember the story and she was having a terrible time keeping them fed and housed and uh, the grain elevator didn't feel that they had any obligation to her at all and so she became one of the uh, town prostitutes mm -hmm. or a woman of easy virtue as sometimes uh, they were called back then. Uh, there was Many another. Many times now they're called sex workers. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, if there weren't customers, there wouldn't be workers. Yeah. Exactly. The, uh, there were two other women who were also involved in uh, prostituting themselves uh, for equally, I mean, they would not have been prostitutes, yeah. but they were destitute. Mm -hmm. And the community did nothing at all to welcome them into community life mm -hmm. and to uh, care for them mm -hmm. as the church or a small town ordinarily would. Mm -hmm. uh, they were left to basically just scramble for whatever they could do. And prostitution was the only thing available. And then my great grandfather arrived in town serving the Methodist church. One of the things that the chief elders of that congregation told him they wanted him to do was to drive away the embarrassment. Oh my. And so he did. He took the uh, 
discretionary fund that was available to him to help take care of hungry people and, you know, whatever. People in need. Mm -hmm. And uh, every Saturday in the afternoon, he would go to those three women and would give them $10, which was a lot of money back mm -hmm. in the 1910s, and would tell them to take the night off. And he would tell them that they were welcome to services the next morning <laughs> at the Methodist church. Well, they never really felt comfortable coming to church, but they very much appreciated the fact that mm -hmm. at least one of the ministers in town cared. He did more than that. But when it got out that the discretionary fund that came out of the offering plate was going to the three prostitutes in town. That's not what the elders of the church intended. Yeah. They wanted those women to be driven away. Mm -hmm. And so they called the bishop. And the bishop looked into the situation by paying a personal call to my great grandpa. And when he found out why it was that Edward Bridwell was doing what he was doing, he stayed over for services. And he preached, and he preached the good news and told them, you are not getting rid of your minister that easily because he is truly a man of God mm -hmm. who has opened the doors of God's house <laughs> to people that you have not cared for. Welcome them. He was there three more years, which is unheard of in the Methodist church, mm -hmm. especially back then. Mm -hmm. And before he was finished, Edward Pridwell had managed uh, a young girl who uh, was orphaned and had just hitched a ride and landed in Delphos uh, and wound up in prostitution. He was able to help her to go to a uh, business school down south a few miles in Salina, Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, foot the whole bill. and. Uh, she managed to get a job. Mm -hmm. And she managed to be a respected uh, woman of the Salina community for the rest of her life. The woman with three children, Edward Bridwell and my great grandmother, matchmate. Mm -hmm. They found a widowed farmer who uh, was really on his last legs emotionally because he just could not continue without a companion for life. Mm -hmm. He married her and in the bargain wound up with three children. <laughs> and the man lived a good, long, healthy life mm -hmm. because he was no longer alone. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the third uh, prostitute. Mm -hmm. um, the Church of Jesus Christ wanted to get rid of the embarrassment of those women. Mm -hmm. And when that minister did the work of Jesus Christ, they wanted to get rid of him too. Mm -hmm. These passages mm -hmm. speak to the whole issue of bearing fruit, mm -hmm. of being nurtured by the intention of God that all might be whole or holy or righteous or the creation might be complete again mm -hmm. whenever we withhold welcome, whenever we withhold support, whenever we allow our anxiety about what will people think to become the predominant uh, reason for our action mm -hmm. or inaction, the end result is we wind up being like that tree that wasn't there long enough to bear fruit. Mm -hmm. Only no amount of manure is going to help because we perceive the manure not to be nourishment, but to be the embarrassment that causes us to close down mm -hmm. and die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm glad I thought about that story. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, uh, I haven't thought of it yet in a long time. Mm. Mm. Well. And that's why we were quiet because there was so much to say. God knew God knew to set our mouths. <laughs> 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 <Let you speak. laughs> yeah. Okay. 
So yeah. that's a lot to grow on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Glad you think so. <laughs> If I, if I had said anything about the tree, it would expand it on to inclusion of the universe and so forth. So I would not have had time. Maybe yeah. some other time. Uh, if, should call them meetings uh, or identify the issues and so forth uh, to be discussed in the meeting and, and have a focus group on so forth. Because otherwise, we just drift as the leaves on the tree would <laughs> start to drift away and uh, mm -hmm. lose sight of the root <laughs> mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and, and we can't cover solutions in bible study and solutions in an hour that would just be nearly impossible <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah in fact uh oftentimes as a minister in all 20 of the churches i've served uh i've come to the conclusion late in the day that uh, the solution is not some uh, cause or some uh, strategy that we agree to. The solution really to making sure that the kingdom of God has its effect as God intended is to uh, get out of the way of our fear and to uh, live into the calling that each of us has. Uh, if we work on this thing together, that's so much the better. But I suspect that God has made each one of us very different so that different problems mm -hmm. can be solved by our very person responding yeah. to the uh, tree of life or mm -hmm. the nourishment that comes from uh, manure and yeah. living water. <laughs> Yeah. Water came through purification. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Through from God, but it's the most pure, so, so that the tree could live. <laughs> that tree would be a tree, truly a tree of life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's very much our individual and in how we reflect ourselves in society, not just on a Sunday, but if every day. But um, but has a has a church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It being the organization that it is, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to almost <laughs> essentially, unfortunately, you have to work like a corporate at times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be to work to be as efficient as you can with what you have. Mm -hmm. Corporates do it to essentially pinch every penny. We maybe the church has to do that too, but 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 we also have the knowledge of good and evil. We, we, we're, we're, I think we're more in tune to it. Yeah. So. Well, uh, next Sunday and for the rest of Lent, we'll be doing a Bible study on the ways that the church deals with those outside the faith. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the ways that we welcome them into faith. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we begin, I think, with the book of Acts next week. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't swear to that. Mm -hmm. Tessa's got next week. So. Mm -hmm. well, we will see you all then. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. All righty. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, Anara. Bye, Anara. <laughs> see you in church. Maybe. <laughs> oh, what did I do? What, what? Here we go. Who is that old man there? Who was you? The only man I see in the picture. <laughs> yeah, the other man we didn't see. We just heard. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. yeah. Bill is kind of sitting in the shadows off the edge of the screen. Yeah, he's a daddy. Yep. Yeah. Cool.